So, please thank you for your seats. And let me to start with the final part of our uh, seminar. Uh, we uh, have been quite uh, serious uh, uh, in the presentations so far, uh, focusing on uh, many, many issues, but I think that what uh, the next speaker is coming with is certainly an intrinsic and important part of the phenomenon we are coming together. Uh, I have to admit now, and maybe some uh, experts will help me, enlighten me a little bit. I think that uh, to speak about Václav Havel and humor, uh, we would know what is it about because uh, we have been, uh, we, we have a lot of material to think about. But humor in Patočka is a little bit uh, uh, strange question for me. And Patočka was a very uh, also social, and he was a very amusing personality. Uh, but uh, I think he would uh, not know what I would, what I should say is just to characterize his spirit, his soul uh, in this context. Uh, we have been talking about parallel voice about the public space that has been opened. Uh, well, still is open, I hope, uh, uh, because of the solidarity of the Schengen. Uh, many things were happening in this context in our country or the other world uh, uh, during our years of struggle against totalitarianism. And this tradition is still alive, and I think that the next speaker is the embodiment of this tradition uh, before mm -hmm. and after the revolution. Jan Makhaček, he is a journalist, but also a musician, rock musician. Uh, he is a uh, quite accomplished uh, journalist today in uh, uh, not only the Czech context, uh, he is also uh, the chairman of board of trustees of the Havel Library, so he is very much competent in this part of the context too. And he agreed, and it was his suggestion, uh, to give us some thoughts, observations as far <coughs> as uh, this aspect. His title is Without Fun and Humor, there would have been neither dissent nor solidarity of the shape. So mm -hmm. fun now is coming to a light an hour. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you very much. I'm obviously uh, for, for the introduction and for the invitation. So I'm certainly not a specialist for this kind of speech because that would be very boring. Uh, so I, I think at one conference I mentioned this topic for about like five minutes, but I was thinking it would be like uh, hopefully some kind of a lively little point into very uh, scientific and important uh, event. Uh, so uh, normally I feel quite safe speaking about economics or or European affairs, but so, so I will be a little bit more light-minded today. You a little bit scared me with the humor in the Patočka because this is not exactly going to be my topic, but uh, uh, I will more speak about humor in dissent, in underground, in, uh, which was very much, as everyone knows, influenced and impacted by Jan Patočka on the other hand. So a lot of people who I would uh, mentioned in, uh, in these, uh, uh, touching these, all these little uh, stories have themselves experienced Jan Patočka and are interested uh, in his uh, uh, philosophical ideas and new in person. So on the other hand, I don't want to say that Jan Patočka was an alien, but it's, it's quite a challenge to Martin and perhaps it's for some next seminar. <coughs> okay, so uh, uh, it seems to me that uh, even though it's unavoidable in life, that uh, it's kind of uh, hard to swallow for myself whenever I hear someone who is some historian who is 30 years old or 35 years old and he's teaching us how it was under the communism. It's normal and natural because historians always uh, have to exchange generations and sometimes it's unsuitable. But whenever I hear most of these people to speak about 70s and 80s, about which they know much more than myself, because it's their profession to focus on a particular period of time, somehow the humor is gone. It, the impression is that uh, in some uh, cellars there were like uh, sitting some very focused, 
expert and hard working but very gloomy <coughs> opponents on the regime preparing this and that. And uh, when I entered this environment of uh, people, I was uh, 15 or 16, it was already in high school, that somehow there, uh, there were a lot of, uh, I would say, like dissident kids, etc in this high school in the suburbs which I entered. So I immediately started my first band when I was 14 and I was in, got involved in many cultural activities. So I remember it absolutely differently. It seems to me it has to definitely do with a sort of historical uh, or memory of optimism or whatever we call it. But uh, the older I get, the more I remember the funny parts of it. And, uh, there is perhaps even some uh, ex sociological explanation which it's not only that we have, I don't know, uh, Kafka and Hasek and whatever in our Czech genes and we are the land of absurdity, etc. It also has to do that unlike in other communist countries at the time, and it also has some tradition in Czech history, uh, <coughs> political dissent was very much influenced and very much formed by people who were not only culture oriented but artists themselves. And with artists it's usually more fun than with uh, some uh, political prof professionals, even though these political professionals have happened to be opponents uh, of the regime or uh, professional opponents of the regime uh, who have to bear consequences of their, of their standings and uh, attitudes. So, it perhaps definitely has to do with this, this fact. But uh, you mentioned that, uh, or someone mentioned that the lunch, unfortunately, uh, actually, that uh, I was uh, playing with uh, plastic people, also I started to play with them when I was 18, I just, uh, and the band couldn't play uh, at concerts anymore at the time, so we were just practicing and recording. And what I remember that I was fascinated with, most of uh, what we did was that we are like 70% 70 70 laughing and 30% working, but we were constantly laughing. <laughs> but it was uh, much more, uh, there were even attempts in this sense in the 70s and 80s too, which are well known to, to institutionalize uh, some uh, kind of funny parts of uh, underground and dissent. Uh, Václav Havel's wife, Olga, was uh, herself like very active and committed to sort of balance the very, very serious part of dissident life and opposition life with something less serious and funny. So she herself initiated two institutions, one which is called like Hrobka, which we would, we would call it like sort of uh, tombstone. Uh, tom tom <laughs> okay, whatever. And another was Brack, which I also don't know how to translate uh, exactly Brack, like a uh, sort of second class literature or very, very low quality literature. And uh, so uh, this Robka was organizing like parties with uh, people were changing dresses, it was devoted to particular topics. So uh, I remember myself like uh, later in the 80s, for instance, which was kind of like predicting uh, in a funny way what was going to happen even though no one could believe it, it was like 1988 that there was a, I think it was New Year's Eve of someone's birthday and Russell Havel was dressed like a king sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, <clears throat> but there were like Japanese parties and antique parties, etc., etc. And uh, the second part of it, Brack uh, was like also oriented like on seriously discuss discussing lit uh, literature which is actually not serious at all or which is very like uh, very uh, trashy. trashy. Yeah, that's, that's the better. So there are even attempts, as I said, to institutionalize the uh, fun. Uh, when you mentioned uh, uh, Václav Havel, he uh, <coughs> himself definitely, but it wasn't only him in this little, this little bit, it has to do with the genes of this country, I would say somehow that uh, that uh, a lot of people who were uh, in this sense uh, so, sort of attracted a lot of absurdity which, was, which brought a lot of uh, fun with it. But Havel himself was like particular 
particle uh, phenomenon in this respect. And it's even documented in a very well done, I think, uh, documentary about Russell Havel by Jan Novak, which I think is, since Jan Novak is an American, uh, so he's got uh, the distance because he was in the 70s, 80s, and he's really able to focus his document on these very absolute uh, topics of the life of Russell Havel. So for those of you who would uh, uh, be interested in it, it's, easy, it it's, it's available and it has English subtitles. So there are a few stories in the film, for instance, that Vasa Havel, after his play audience, is uh, distributed and uh, produced in underground on tapes. So he uh, uh, is driving to Hradaček in his car and he often used to take hitchhikers because he uh, remembered somehow that he was, when he was in the military how it was important for, to get, to, to, for him to get a lift. So he was constantly taking hitchhikers and he took someone and, and he said, like, you look like a, like a decent man, can I play you something? And he played in the uh, audience in his car, even though, the, uh, even though, and he didn't reveal that he is the author and he is even speaking on the tape. So, and uh, he tells the stories about uh, uh, inviting uh, secret police which are guarding Hradeček for tea because he, well, it was freezing too much outside, so he regretted them and invited them for, for tea, etc., etc. So there are all these like uh, little absurd stories uh, collected about, about Havel, but not only about Havel. This uh, sort of orientation on, not orientation, like the byproduct for someone, I, I don't know, uh, uh, some, someone definitely could say that I am too much fun oriented since I wasn't, since I wasn't sentenced to, uh, to sit in many years in prison, so I was, I, uh, which is true, so I went uh, often to some interrogations which I, uh, I participated in this and that, but I never was uh, sentenced or even threatened to be sentenced, so I had it easy in this system. Uh, but uh, even very dramatic uh, situations were usually in my environment, which was sort of a second family for me at the time, uh, accompanied by a lot of fun. Uh, Honza Brabet's drummer of Plastic People, later on very uh, politically uh, active before the revolution and uh, organizing uh, distributing leaflets and this and that. He was one uh, uh, called sort of red-handed, like uh, dropping leaflets from the department store and taken to Bartolomiska. And they let him sitting there uh, for a little while uh, and there was a board. There was a board, and he said, so he was. He suddenly saw a photo of a soccer team, and it was this STB soccer team, and there were these like guys with mustaches and with a ball and embracing each other. So he took it uh, over the, and put it into his pocket, and then only then they started to pocket search him before another phase of the interrogation and, and the key and money and, and what is this photo? And he said like, these are my friends. We are playing soccer. Okay, so you can keep it. So they didn't recognize this. <laughs> and then the photo itself of this STV soccer team was was reproduced in uh, underground publishing in the revolver. <laughs> like, but this is a soccer uh, team of uh, secret police, like obviously uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. his uh, story. <laughs> or uh, uh, Sasha Bondra, speaker of Charter 77 at the time was, um, and well, this might be a very difficult, Ma Martin could tell me perhaps like dozens of funny stories like that, but uh, then uh, he, like a speaker of Charter, was uh, followed by the police, so but normal thing happened to them. Uh, we lived in a shortage economy, so his wife sent him to buy a new uh, closet to the bathroom, to the toilet. So we and Standard Evati, another speaker of Chata Services, and were traveling around Prague suburbs trying to buy, buy a closet, but it was impossible to get a proper closet because it was a shortage economy. And they were constantly followed by two cars of secret police who saw that it's some. <laughs> what kind of a tricky game would have they played with when they meet someone in a, like, uh, and then dragging the closet and then they thought that's a 
there's something in the process. So it's, I think uh, these things are uh, uh, speaking about uh, Sasha in this respect. I also remember that there was a fire in the apartment downstairs, which also, by the way, belonged to uh, this woman, Chenna, and uh, her husband. And there was a fire during the night, and at five o'clock at the morning, someone was ringing the bell. And they thought it's a secret police, so they didn't want to open, so they all they could, they could be, they had been quite adventurous, and someone was knocking the door, and it was this fireman in this uh, special like equipment, uh, so, and he said, like, we don't, we don't want to open, we are a secret police, etc. <coughs> we are not uh, fire, uh, you know, secret police, we are firemen. <laughs> But they still still took a lot of time before they before they believed in that it's really happening that there is really a fire. <laughs> uh, signing petitions, which was a very again like if you are would be a young historian who you know, always sign on this and that petition, <coughs> you wouldn't probably realize that most of these petitions were not only signed but also written in pubs in which uh, we spent a lot of time at the time. And signing petition in SPA, protesting <coughs> this and that, it was a it was a thing which we did on a daily basis, basically, especially in Glamov Karstram. So uh, after uh, uh, there were first computers introduced to uh, in descent, I would say that one of them was operated by uh, Martin's uh, sister-in-law, who was uh, unfortunately Marketa, who unfortunately passed away two years ago. So, uh, uh, so she started only with the computer to try to do some order in petitions, and she found out that some people, I think the record was reached by Achim Topol, who was signed by under one petition 26 times, <laughs> because he was signing these petitions in different pubs, and he didn't remember <laughs> he signed it before. And, uh, but I myself was signed like six times on the web petition and my ex-wife like eight times, so it was like very common thing, which sounds kind of absurd, but these things are happening uh, normally. Uh, obviously when demonstrations started during 1988 and 99, after every demonstration there was sort of an analysis and evaluation in the pub also, obviously. So the, we would know the pub that we would meet after and we would and people usually bet from what the cannons were coming gradually and telling the stories, so it wasn't only like uh, absolutely uh, serious. Uh, I remember that, for instance, that a group of us uh, visited uh, the castle Bezdias, which is a beautiful medieval castle. And it was a trip devoted to Karel Hinek uh, Macha, who wrote a poem about Bezies uh, and, uh, and was a most important Czech uh, romantic, uh, more modern uh, poet, we could even say. And we were accompanied by Egon Bondi, a philosopher and a writer, who took like this group of young, long-haired people going up to Bezies. <coughs> and we expected this to give us uh, some lecture about Rimacha, but somehow while in the castle we thought we are alone in the room like in here, but we didn't know there is some like proper family next door who could listen to everything. So uh, Bondet somehow didn't speak about Macha, but he was like uh, uh, speaking very badly about communists, but in very like nasty language, like idiots, idiots. And then he was speaking about Soviet films of 1930s and Suddenly, after Bondi had this lecture, which lasted like 20 minutes, they were, this family was like sneaking from the, and they just didn't understand what is happening because they didn't hear anyone ever officially or unofficially to speak about communists this way. And then there was this old guy and a group of young people with long hair listening, like they really didn't know what's going on. So then, uh, after going down from the castle, because it was area neighboring the Soviet military. Uh, uh, barracks, so there were some some Russian officers at the pub, and Bo Bondi was trying to uh, uh, sell them his watch or something. And, 
And Martin Machovets was trying to uh, was telling them they are not marching properly because they don't have <laughs> But then one of these guys told them like, okay, you know, I was in Afghanistan, I'm gonna shoot you if you <laughs> stupid like jokes. So. <laughs> somehow in the 70s and 80s like it was uh, obviously Easy in this respect, there would be like that much fun in the 1950s, I can uh, imagine. Just uh, a lot of people were working very hard in this end. I would say that they were like uh, in, very industrious. So I remember that I was uh, sitting in the pub. I don't actually cannot tell who invented it, but we invented it at that time in the evening. We invented uh, a unit of industriousness in this end which was Van Uhl. Uh, Peter Uhl is a uh, famous Czech uh, dissident uh, in UHL, which is not a very typical Czech name, and it sounds also strange, so it's a good name for a unit. And this uh, Catholic activist, An An Augustin uh, Navratil from Moravia, we rated him 4.8 Uhl, because he was <laughs> only, uh, only working constantly. And when Vasa Havel found out that he was very jealous that he didn't invent it himself and he was asking how much he is, he is rated like in pools, so he said like it's gonna be something 2.8 <laughs> so, uh, We were constantly invented these uh, jokes like that after after events which were a combination of some philosophical discussion that could turn to the party which uh, Martin experienced many times in Vietnam. Uh, there were like, situations like that uh, poet Kremlichka was, uh, was walking the dog with his, in his underpants in Karlo Ranjeski, or Fanda Panik, the poet, was eating yogurt in the church. Uh, mm -hmm. And when he was uh, with someone sort of caught him red-handed eating yogurt in, in the church. And the, <laughs> so what I was doing, he said, like, so it's, I'm hangover and it's very cold in here, so I, I enjoy it much better than outside. Because <laughs> <laughs> so there could be endless uh, uh, stories like this. But perhaps I was always like too much fun oriented, I admit, especially when I was young. I even remember when I visited like Josef Mogorel's seminar after we analyzed like first page of uh, Jan Patočka's piece on Socrates. Mm -hmm. Josef told me that it's probably not good for me <laughs> because I wasn't very patient. To, to, uh, to, because I thought, uh, after I visit like 20 times, I was still going to be at page one or something. So, <laughs> so I didn't was much, I probably wasn't much into these like uh, serious things and more into the funny things. <laughs> so, uh, but I could have one serious thing which is only loosely connected this and in this end, but I would perhaps it could be, it's an interesting topic for uh, uh, people who are professionally interested in these uh, things or thinking about them philosophically, but it's actually like uh, interesting that I also happen to work uh, in uh, quite big media corporations starting after respect for a while in like 13 years ago as I was for a while in the lab and the etc. And then I found out like, that still in major corporations, already in a free world, you have the same attitudes and the same behavior of prevailing populations you know, like you have other communism. I was just fascinated because it, we didn't have it like this in respect because we started to respect ourselves and it had its pros and cons. But absolutely normally people are telling me, okay, they didn't like something, they wanted to be critical to it, they said like, I'm not going to say it in the meaning I have a mortgage. Mortgage is the new like slogan of these days. If you have a mortgage, you somehow shouldn't pay, shouldn't speak your mind freely. And people say it absolutely not. You say it on the meeting because I have a mortgage. So I am just really fascinated how much of these like attitudes from 70s and 80s of the prevailing number of population easily translated themselves into these normal days. And I have asked ask myself into what extent it's typical for a very Czech environment or into what extent it's absolutely global and normal. 
Uh, people just say one thing privately, and then they go around the corner and they say something completely different. It's absolutely normal. And I, I, I was just like fascinated how much, uh, how much it uh, uh, is still happening these days. And it also might uh, be worth analyzing socially because there is a question of uh, existential threat, also in to an extent which is different these days than it was in the 70s and 80s, when we were in 1915, in a sense that uh, uh, in 17 and 80s, if you were a dissident, you were earning like a night guard, 800 crowns, 1,000 crowns. If you were a stoker working physically, you would earn like 2,000 crowns. But average rent was 100 crowns. It was just like one twentieth of your income. Whereas these days it's usually like one third or one half of your income. So to be independent, to express your attitudes freely, in a way measured of the by the existential threat was a little bit different. Oh, because, okay, if you didn't want a car or a luxurious apartment, which we didn't want, you would have no problem to pay the rent, which is the most important thing. Ever. And okay, for, for the food you would pay somehow. But if you decided to, uh, to be free, you usually, unless you were really behaving like even Martin Heroes who really wasn't afraid to go to the prison again and again. So if you decided to be free and you didn't risk that perhaps it could happen, you could go to prison, but it wasn't like very probable to be honest. So how much you were risking? So this is a very interesting topic and I don't want to draw any conclusion, but it's the situation was in a very different. But uh, I don't know, uh, we have foreigners here, so perhaps we can uh, they can tell us all, also if it's normal or not to say like, oh, I have a mortgage, I, don't, I cannot speak freely, so uh, is this also normal in Western countries? Okay, so thanks for this little uh, uh, opportunity to be here. <laughs> Anders uh, reminded us of an important phenomenon which is very often uh, easily forgotten. Uh, just following a little bit, uh, uh, obviously the question was uh, um, whether the community of uh, dissidents, or how to call these individuals, uh, was to be caused and isolated, or, or what kind of openness uh, uh, we uh, had. And uh, it's uh, very true that uh, uh, the fun <coughs> and uh, ability to communicate freely uh, without these constraints, uh, mortgages were not invented or <laughs> were not part of our world at all, uh, but uh, uh, we were enjoying our freedom of expression uh, much more uh, than uh, average uh, population. And this freedom of expression had some ways how uh, it was radiating uh, out from these closed circles and had sometimes infectious effects, maybe even uh, more uh, substantive effects than very well written petitions and serious proposals, because obviously serious proposals would not be taken as serious proposals because we all thought that communism would be with us forever and that the system was so well prepared uh, to deal with us. And actually they didn't know themselves how to deal with this phenomenon, because on the one hand they could take us too seriously uh, and uh, I don't know what would be then the reaction, but at the same time uh, they like to present this group of people as crazies. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the language of the um, uh, uh, third basket of the Helsinki conference, uh, I wanted to mention this point yesterday, uh, lawyers will immediately understand that. You know, it, uh, the label is human rights and humanitarian issues. Mm -hmm. uh, human rights and humanitarian issues are all connected with individual human beings, but uh, it's, they are two different things. Uh, and uh, I think that police would love to take us in the best case as a humanitarian problem, as a group of crazies that might be 
uh, given sometimes difficult, more difficult times, sometimes to break, but not as a real challengers, uh, delegitimizers of the systems. But I think that is a very old wisdom. Uh, if uh, we were surrounded by evil, uh, which was the case, I think uh, evil and uh, humor, even laughter, uh, uh, there's an interesting correction. Uh, I think devil never smiles. But still, if you want to protect yourself against its impact, uh, ridiculization is the most uh, frequent, uh, and maybe childish, uh, but strategy, how to do it. You can find it in uh, all traditional uh, 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 dramas. Uh, the devils need to be ridiculized. <coughs> and uh, uh, so I think that this was the part of the problem. Uh, it helped people not only to survive, uh, but uh, to, uh, I would say, send uh, uh, sometimes a very powerful message, uh, in spite of the fact that it was uh, just ridiculous. And uh, after all, plastic people uh, and their story uh, uh, maybe is the beginning of uh, the whole thing. Uh, I'm always finding that fascinating, and everybody around the world that uh, when they started to explore the relationship between rock, uh, rock and roll, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, how to get rid of communism. Uh, actually, uh, very serious drama by Tom Stoppard uh, is about that. So. Uh, Certainly, a very important dimension. But floor is yours. Uh, on the asked question, so maybe he deserves some answer or reaction. Yes, please, Barbara. I would rather like to know more about society for America today, because I think that was actually drawing in the general public. It, it was not just the humour among the dissidents, but it was also planned to involve the general public. And I wonder if there was anything you could say. Uh, well, perhaps I misunderstood uh, your question. You, you said that you like that at the end I mentioned general public like with... Uh, no, no uh, I, I said, I wonder if there's anything that you can tell us about the society or the society... In the 70s and 80s. Ah, ah, okay, this uh, uh, was actually the name of this, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I should have. Yeah, that's right. I, I wasn't uh, part of it uh, myself, it was a different uh, group, but they were also like, uh, and they were friends, and uh, they were, uh, uh, for instance, they would, that, that was a, it, it still has this name, the Street of Political Prisoners, but I, I, it kept somehow. Uh, miraculously this name under the communists because they meant probably that it means political prisoners during the Nazi occupation or, or, or perhaps from Austrian monarchy, whatever. It had a general name, but it was a street like where it, it's still a street very close to Manchester Square. So they were like every Thursday or something, there was a run of people for liberating political prisoners running through the street of political prisons, so that's what smart for instance. So, so whoever had time, whatever, say Monday at 5 o'clock, he would meet at the run end of the street and people were running to the, to the other Wait, but it had, a, it had a funny name. What was this? Polish was from Resolution, so just... Yeah, what can be a seminal I don't remember exactly the name, but, but uh, or for instance, they invited uh, all the, because already in 89, 88, there, were, there was a proliferation of different uh, sort of activities and movements, and sometimes they differ in opinions like what to do next. So, so they invited them for a <coughs> uh, childish playground, like on, on the sand, and uh, well, I don't know how to say Babovich in English, I don't know, like uh, uh, little forms. Little yeah, forms, little forms. Yeah. forms playing in the sand. Mm -hmm. Yes, so Marcel Havel and very important people like this were playing Babovichki at the mm -hmm. childish playground and it was supposed to be symbolic yes, that the children's, on a yes. children's playground. I, I, I people know. shouldn't do only that Babovichki but they should work together or something. It was, but it was a symbol expressed in this very funny way but uh, they did a lot of other things like that which I, 
And what they're looking at is how much of a policy was there actually to to involve to to take what was a, a group activity and to take it out to the public. And you do you think this was to do with the particular period, the particular age that they were able to to start meeting? It definitely has to do with uh, with uh, with much with the. Uh, as Martin uh, correctly said, none of us believe that the communism has collapsed and we thought it's going to be true for a long time, even a few weeks, few months before 1989, which is a different topic, before 17th November. But during 1989, there was a, already a lot of new people, new generation joined these sort of independent uh, activities. Coincidentally, but, or not coincidentally, once again, there are artists also. For instance, the founder of uh, uh, of this Polish Zavarskaya so Chesnos Baraš Kipanova is an actress. So once again, in this respect, it was similar like uh, generations before and, and before. So it's uh, but uh, it, it is, uh, more and more people were less afraid to express <laughs> themselves publicly in this way or initiate this and I'll be in there on their names. <coughs> Which, judging from current perspective, it was clear that it's gonna uh, also contribute to the fall of the regime. But uh, at that time, we don't know. We thought, okay, so perhaps it's gonna be some real perestroika because Czechs communists are not even pretending to do perestroika according to Soviets. But okay, we thought it may, it, maybe it's gonna be some perestroika, but uh, still the regime could be here for for a long time. Uh, so. Uh, these things were, uh, like, like this run, were in, intended to attract the attention of the people, but the only way, at that time obviously there was no internet, so only way it could work basically was that you were listening to Voice of America or Radio of Europe and they would announce, or because they were frequently speaking about this run, so you would know from listening to the radio that if you joined, when I joined the run, you know it from the radio, you, you had a chance. So you could, but the... Uh, I don't think it actually worked that way. That most of the people who joined the, who joined the run were somehow friends of people who organized the run. So there was even people knew about it. Most of them were quite afraid to, to join. That is my interpretation. What do you think, Martin? Well, uh, I, frankly speaking, have uh, had never opportunity to run uh, there. Um, but uh, it was very, I would say, uh, refreshing uh, to uh, know that these people are there, and I uh, liked the idea a lot. Okay, so, yes, I mean, <laughs> uh, sorry, I thought that the, the question was if these actions were like intended for by the public no, to no, how okay, well, well, to I don't think that they were intended problem. for wider public. But what was, uh, I would say, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I would say some sort of generational change and even dialogue or maybe even dispute uh, between the different generations. Uh, I think that there certainly was something like that, and uh, the uh, disputed thing was, I would say, uh, original charges uh, liked uh, really uh, to, uh, they were uh, used to certain type of work, uh, petitions, maybe books, uh, maybe uh, things that were rather done inside of, uh, uh, their spaces, and then in the mid of 80s, out of sudden, more street fests, street parties mm -hmm. uh, started to become an attractive way how to, uh, I would say, present uh, non-orthodox, unofficial, spontaneous uh, view. Uh, I think it was a sheer spontaneity. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was impatience of uh, these spontaneous people uh, that they wanted to, uh, they didn't want to wait for something because they knew that waiting would be waiting for Godot or for uh, something that could not necessarily come. And uh, so I could imagine now that all sorts of, I would say, political architects uh, would be saying, oh, you don't, should do that. But it was a spontaneity, it was a joyful spontaneity. Mm -hmm. And obviously joyful spontaneity is infectious, uh, I think. Uh, then uh, once you do it, and once you see that people can do it, uh, you tell people, so why should I do it? Uh, because, uh, People are like that. Uh, so obviously, uh, the parties uh, 
on the bench were, I would say, private parties, but we were a rather open uh, society. Uh, but uh, then Martin Wiechert, uh, still is doing that, started his open air rock uh, festival in Trudnov. And it was a great challenge because uh, the first year it was it was before 1989. So it was the test whether uh, something like that could happen. There was this uh, festival, Divadelny uh, uh, something festival in uh, in Strzelecki Ostrov in Prague. Uh, so if you go there, you could see on all these stages uh, out of sudden uh, people uh, like you know, Barak Stepanova just playing there. And obviously, uh, they use their own ways how to uh, send certain messages out. Uh, Isra Shugla once uh, uh, described the whole uh, situation from a sociological point of view and called it a gray zone. Uh, they were dissidents, uh, uh, let's say you can pick up whatever color you want, white, and uh, there was the regime uh, on the other side. So the question was to start uh, not building bridges, but zones where mm -hmm. people can enter mingle and share things and obviously uh, these type of activities were much easier uh, to share with others mm -hmm. and uh, this spontaneity and I think it was the, mm -hmm. its basic uh, uh, you know the really then the challenging question is how this can be connected with uh, uh, I'm not really looking for a word uh, with uh, uh, Serious transformation in the moment when it starts. You can imagine that on Tahir Square in uh, mm -hmm. uh, Cairo, uh, they could have many people uh, of this mentality. <coughs> you can uh, the whole revolution actually uh, could be perceived as a street party uh, uh, mm -hmm. with music, uh, with uh, all sorts of nice things. Uh, but then, uh, if you if nothing wrong uh, happens, then it needs to be transformed into something. Mm -hmm. And the question is that uh, this institution building uh, uh, is uh, how it can uh, follow up these uh, uh, things. Václav Havel's castle, by the way, uh, it was a uh, castle in the moment of Carnival, I think, uh, in the first uh, months for sure. It was, uh, I would say, many discovering of a uh, space that was certainly unavailable uh, for these people uh, before. Uh, and then Vasavada uh, always, and he liked to say actually, uh, that uh, his place among the world politicians is uh, very specific because they were listening to him uh, very cautiously, very carefully, and taking very seriously what he said. But I would like to say that he was perceived as a clown, but he was perceived as someone, uh, uh, as a stranger uh, coming to a uh, well established party. Uh, and uh, so he was a really disturber of peace, uh, uh, not only uh, before uh, the uh, revolution, uh, but even after uh, the revolution. And the way how he could have disturbed the peace, uh, I think there was this humor. But last thing, and I will give you a phone. Uh, Hala always repeated that he believes that the most important um, uh, instrument of quality of a politician is taste. Uh, this type of intuitive thing, uh, in Kant it would be uh, uh, the way of uh, thinking, Denkungsart in German, uh, which, uh, which uh, knows that there are other people here around. Yeah. And uh, so Hamel I think was driven very often by these judgments, uh, by aesthetic judgments. You can, sometimes can say that aesthetics is dangerous and can be seductive, mm -hmm. uh, that's very true. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, Ivan is not listening, so I can say that, is still we believe in, uh, in a bonum, uh, uh, justum and pulchrum. Mm -hmm. uh, so pulchrum was quite, quite important uh, in uh, our metaphysical track. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think aesthetics it was really dangerous for feminists because they have no sense for aesthetics, uh, <laughs> and maybe also for you more limited. And uh, and uh, that is my question: if uh, uh, this uh, putting flowers on this uh, Malay it was uh, used to 
do every year, or it was invented for that 1989? Because so really, this putting uh, of the flowers it's it opened the public space. It was each year. When it is, it was an anniversary. It was, it was, it was each year. Yeah. Oh, no, no, it was in the 1989. Uh, this it, was very, it was very new thing then. It was new thing. Yeah. It was new thing. Yeah, because uh, <coughs> this putting of flowers and uh, this uh, this foolish uh, uh, <coughs> uh, taking him a uh, uh, sentence uh, to, the, to the jail because of uh, this putting of flowers. To, uh, but what's the matter? No, 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 just let me to correct that. Uh -huh. uh, it was a group of spokesperson of Charles 77, uh, Sasha Vondra Baradimcova, uh, who was the third one. Uh, uh, who were putting these flowers on behalf of Charlie? Uh, uh, Vaslav uh, was very curious uh, how what would happen, so he was just observing that situation. <laughs> but he, not because he was afraid, but because uh, uh, he was not a spoke person. And obviously, he was the first who was uh, arrested on the Wenceslav Square, and then uh, they uh, uh, accused him uh, because I think that he made a statement. Uh, that was broadcast in the radio free yeah, Europe, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which invited uh, people uh, to come there, uh, and so yeah. they uh, accused him of uh, trying to uh, organize uh, anti anti yeah, state. Yeah, yes, uh, it, uh, it was a paragraph called Natasha, and there was an article about this yesterday in Little Italy. Yeah, but he even didn't uh, put the flowers, uh, but he was arrested. He was arrested. Well, I, mean, I think that if you look at uh, go to the. Another Giovanni would mean like, like taking sides. It mm -hmm. was an offense. By the way, that's very true. Uh, that's, uh, this event on Wenceslav Square started to uh, be a uh, yeah. signal of that. New uh, era. Uh, I think the year before yeah. uh, it was the demonstrations, uh, 28th of October, uh, 21st of August, and then uh, the National Day, 28th of October, and then uh, obviously Palachi got famous because mm -hmm. the square was full of people. <laughs> because for international guests, I, I, I was employed in Shkoda Expo at the time that I could uh, see from the window each that uh, Palak week. That uh, like was occupied Wall Street, and in, th in that time, police, check, check, police uh, uh, occupied this this whole area around uh, San Benzeslas, not to make uh, not to make demonstration, yeah, to pre pre prevent prevent this space of, of grouping of people, people then grouping uh, on the on the street of Benzeslas Square, on this on this on this uh, margins of Benzeslas Square, but they they cannot uh, go. Uh, to the to the statue of San, San Benzeslas, uh -huh. and then in the evenings so of all these palace weeks, uh, there were fighting, struggling about also this this water. How do I say in English? This this uh, this uh, water cannon, cannon. Uh, water water cannon, and so on. And uh, and then the, and once I went from Skoda uh, Export to to the Grand Passage, and just uh, against me uh, came this uh, policeman, but he was alone. And I saw uh, fear in his eyes. He has everything around him. He has his uh, all uh, guns and everything, but uh, he was afraid of me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think that uh, we are uh, getting uh, to the end of our uh, experiments. Uh, uh, we have now, uh, or we are finishing with memories, and I think that that's what Polis is about as a kind of collective memory. Uh, this is still alive and present and needs to be, I would say, uh, uh, kept uh, alive. I think that this seminar, uh, because it was for the first time, we really uh, uh, try to focus on the space in between, let's say, philosophy of Jan Patochka and so the much more complicated, broader uh, world of Václav Havel. Parts of the library and the Patochka's archives now uh, hopefully will be working together because uh, I don't think that we have resolved all the problems uh, that we have uh, touched upon uh, during uh, these two days. What I will try to do as a main inspirator of that, I will be uh, going after all active participants and uh, hopefully they will send me uh, their uh, beautiful contributions in a final written form. Uh, we have uh, recorded the whole thing, so uh, I think that this will be in some way available even for you if you would need 
uh, to have it as a uh, guide for your editorial uh, work. Because I certainly would love to uh, uh, publish uh, or to edit a small volume. Uh, this will be very helpful, I will tell you right away. Uh, I have an opportunity to teach uh, Mozart too and some other to uh, students that uh, can read only in English, so it can turn immediately into a very useful uh, material for us. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, we will be planning uh, in uh, our future activities again uh, uh, similar occasions, but by more specific focus on something, uh, not just taking all um, uh, everything around it from sort of holistic approach, but uh, the, I think it's a rather start uh, at the end. We need to thank uh, Yolana, uh, who is sits over there. Uh, of her uh, proud home uh, is uh, tremendous. Uh, we have discovered that uh, atmosphere and spirits here uh, at home and so uh, we certainly will come to you uh, to uh, uh, suggest uh, future forms of uh, cooperation with the half uh, yeah, institute uh, which Eola uh, has found it, uh, in uh, Prague exactly for uh, this type of similar activities. Beautiful place, beautiful time. So that's all, and uh, still deserve to have uh, some refreshments. So if you have time, go ahead and wine and cheese. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>